I was thinking earlier, the first missions conference I came to this church was in 1976. I have a collection of New Testaments that several of you may have signed along the way and different things that God has done, but you've been involved in our life for many, many years as a child when I was in Peru with my parents and then as adults when, again, you uh, helped them and have supported them and supported us as we began the ministry there in Miami. Uh, you provided me a wonderful daughter-in-law. That's probably your greatest accomplishment. No, actually, it was the grandkid she gave me that was the greatest accomplishment. But, uh, and you were supporting and being involved with them in London, which, by the way, they're doing wonderful. I know you had a team there last year. We just had a team come back for their second anniversary. I think they had about 115 that day for services, had a wonderful time, and God is doing it. And I thank you for what you've done and the investment in our life over the years. I ask you to look inside your bulletins. The title of the message today is The Gospel is Global. The Gospel is Global. And I want to read this passage before we go to the Lord in prayer. In Luke chapter 24 and verse 45, Jesus said, Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written, that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you would guide us today, that you would help us to lay aside all the stuff outside, help us to focus in for just a few minutes on what you might need to say to each of us individually. Lord, I'm, I'm going to preach a message to everyone, but Lord, you're going to apply it to the individual that is here. Lord, you don't bring us to church just so we can hear more. We can hear from home. We can hear better preachers than we're going to listen to today. But Lord, listening to your voice is what I want and what I hope you will speak to you all today. In Jesus' name, amen. Last year, and it was the 40th anniversary of our church, and I was at a conference up in Boston, just a one-day conference, and the speaker was speaking on outside churches and inside churches, churches for outsiders and for insiders. And one of the things he was doing, he, as he went through, he made this statement. He said, churches that use their initials, whether they like it or not, they become insider churches because only they know what their initials mean. And so as they did that, I'm there as the pastor of IBB going, oh, crud. <laughs> and so after it was over, I went to the speaker and I had my business card and I pulled it out and I said, hi, I'm the pastor of IBB church. He said, great. And I said, let me explain why we are initials. And I explained to him, we're in Miami and, and we have a bilingual church. And, and in English, it stands for International Bible Baptist. And in Spanish, it stands for Iglesia Biblica Bautista. And I said, it just, it's just kind of better for everybody if we just go by IBB. And he said, that's great. So you're an ethnic church. I said, well, not exactly. I said, we're, we're a church that's trying to reach the whole neighborhood, and we have all kind of people. It just happens to be in two languages right now. Somebody wants us down here. Okay, I'll, do I need to move up? Nah, you already did all that work. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. And, and so I, I, I said, that, that's why we do it. He said, listen, if you want to reach everybody, you probably need to find a word that's the same in English and Spanish that everybody in your neighborhood would understand, and then you make the name mean whatever you want it to mean. I said, okay, 
So that started the process. And we began thinking. I went back to my seat, and Pastor Marcel was right next to me, and I said, we're going to have to change the name of our church. He said, yeah, I got that message too. So we shared it with our church, and we just asked them to pray, and, and I said, now, here's the deal. It's got to be, and we gave them the, the parameters, and we started getting everybody. Well, while they were worrying about the name, I was worried about what goes with the name. Let me help you. When I say where shopping is a pleasure, what am I talking about? When I say dress for less, what am I talking about? made my point. This is just for the Spanish speakers. And when I say, donde el nombre lo dice todo. Now, you got to be from Hialeah to get this. Anybody from there? Anybody? No? Donde el nombre lo dice todo. Anybody know? What is that? What is? Uh, that's what it said, but it represents a store in Hialeah called Ñoque Barato. And if you're Spanish, you're going, I can't believe you said that. But hey, that's, on, that's in Okeechobee. It's right there on the side of the building. And it's amazing because with just something like that, so all of a sudden, as we're asking people to give us ideas for names, the, the, the one I really liked, and it was the first one that came up, it was chocolate. Because that's the same in English and Spanish. We, we have dark chocolate, we have light chocolate, we have hot chocolate. You know, we, that was our church. That's not what we put on the building, but that was my favorite the, of all the ideas that came out. But when it was all said and done, the name of our church is global. But it's global, and, and the logo says this, for everyone, everywhere. For everyone, everywhere. See, God's heart and desire is for everyone everywhere to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. That's what it tells us in 1 Timothy 2.4. And the amazing thing about that is that he wants us to be involved in making that happen. Now, when you stop and think about that, that is amazing. Why? Because when Jesus went up to heaven... I can just imagine the angels are there going, okay, Lord, you, you went through a lot down there. You went through all kind of stuff. Now, how are we going to get that out to everybody? He said, well, I've told my disciples I want them to get this good news out to everyone. He goes, the who? The disciples. You do remember who these guys were, right? The, the, <laughs> one of the 12 didn't even make it. And, and the one that you thought was going to be the leader, he actually denied you three times. And, and then the others just couldn't believe it. They all scattered during the tough time. We're putting this all in their hand. Don't you have a plan B? And I'm sure Jesus said, no, there's no plan B. That's, and there's still no plan B. It's still us. So the question I want us to ask today is, what are we going to have to do to make God's desire a reality in our lifetime? In our lifetime. Let me give you three things. The first thing that's going to have to happen is we're going to have to enlarge our heart. We're going to have to enlarge our heart. I've already mentioned Peter. He's one of the few people in the Bible that we have a record of him from the very first encounter he had with Jesus all the way to much later in his life. In fact, at the beginning, when, when he in, had the encounter, his brother brought him to Jesus, and Jesus says, you know, you're, you're, you're Simon, but I'm going to call you Peter. And he's going, huh? He, he, he couldn't even buy into that. He, Jesus believed more in him than he believed in himself in many ways. But the Peter that we see there and the Peter that wrote Second Peter are two different people. It's like this guy has been transformed amazingly. 
And every part, every step in his transformation had something to do with either a question or a command that Jesus gave him and how he responded to it. The first one was, follow me. And if Peter had said, sorry, I'm busy today. Sorry, got too much to do. I can't just leave my family. I can't. If that had been his response, you and I would have never heard the name Peter because he wouldn't follow. There's some of you here today, maybe, maybe, you're here because you got drug here. I mean, you, not drugged and brought, but just literally dragging, <laughs> okay? They, they got you here. And you're sitting there and you're going, but why am I here? Because they really want you to, to follow Jesus and, they, and Jesus is saying follow, but if you don't, that's, that's on you. They got you to where you would hear, follow. Peter followed. Peter followed. Now, we don't know a lot. He didn't say a lot during the, it's just kind of observing, seeing what's going on, blah, blah, blah. But then one day, Jesus said, who do people say that I am? And they said, well, some people say this, some people say that, some people say the other. And then he said, but who do you say that I am? And I have this feeling that he kind of looked straight at Peter and said, who do you say that I am? Now, Peter had to fess up. And he said, I, I believe you're the Christ. I believe you're the son of the living God. That changed everything. We, we take a step of growth. Now, the interesting thing about that is that most of what you and I know about Peter happens after that and before the next step. If I were to ask you, what do you know about the life of Peter? Most of you would tell, well, he walked on water. He did this. The Lord said, get behind me, Satan. You know, all these things about Peter. That happened at this stage. But then there came a time after the resurrection, after Peter had denied him three times, after Peter, after Jesus had said to the women, go tell the disciples and Peter to come and meet me in Galilee. At that point, we see that Jesus said to Peter, do you love me more than these? Now that these is the issue, right? Was it the fish? Was it fishing? Was it the other disciples? Who was he talking to? I don't know. But the bottom line is Jesus wanted to make sure, do you love me more than whatever this is that, that he was referring to? Do you love me more than these? Well, how could he prove it? He said, if you love me, feed my sheep. Care for my lambs. Now, Peter could have said, now, Jesus, wait a minute. When you said to follow me, you said you were going to make me a fisherman. I thought you were a fisherman. You just said fisherman of men. Okay, okay, we round them up in a net. We get them together. Now you're telling me I got to be a shepherd? And Jesus goes, yeah. Let me tell you something about your spiritual life. There's only one thing ahead of you if you're going to follow Jesus. It's follow him and help someone else follow him too. That's the job. You know the problem in most churches? 80% of people have never become responsible for the spiritual growth and well-being of somebody else. It's all about them. It's all about me, how I feel, how I, how I grow, I want to grow, I want to be in my prayer closet, I want to be outside, I want to do this, I, 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 I. And Jesus is going, no, no, it's not all about I, I, I. It's about you take a few steps and you bring somebody along and you take the few steps and you help them and you go, well, I haven't been to seminary. Good, you hadn't been all messed up yet. Don't, don't worry about it. <laughs> Just teach what God has already taught you Teach someone else. One of the missionaries that your church supported years ago is named Gail Reddish. Anybody remember that name way back in the day? They're all gone. <laughs> Great cloud of witnesses. Okay. She was in Peru. She was a missionary supported by this church. And there was a need for, a court, there were, for musicians 
we, we were starting churches or they were starting churches and they needed musicians. And so she came to the States and she took an accordion back, an accordion book and a bunch of accordions. People had accordions in their closet. They were just giving her accordions. And she got back and I remember she began learning accordion. And I knew it because her apartment was upstairs. There's no air conditioner. The window was open. So you're going, oh, the blessed time. <laughs> the second week, it was the right hand. And work it, da, 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 week two. Week three, put the left hand and the right hand together. Week three. Week four, she began giving accordion lessons. <laughs> I remember saying to my mom, Mom, Gail doesn't know how to play. How can she teach? And she said, she knows more than they do. <laughs> well, there you go. She had just stayed three weeks ahead of everybody. <laughs> and about six months into it, we had musicians for eight different churches. I have never seen that before. I haven't seen it much after. <laughs> and i tell you what. The same principle applies to you in your Christian life. Why do Christians have so much trouble? They got so much in, and they ain't got much out, and it's starting to stink inside them. That's a different message, but we will keep going. <laughs> Enlarge our heart. The last step of Peter was about 15 years after he had been the leader of the church. The church had now grown. It was thousands. He was the recognized leader of that day. And Jesus said, you got something else you got to learn. So he gets a call. Some guys come over, not a cell phone. Guys came over. And he was said, this Gentile is asking you to come over. At first, Paul's going, no, nah, they're going to do that. Holy Spirit had to do a little extra work to get him out there. But you know what? When he got there, he realized something. Let me read these words to you. Ready? Acts chapter 10, verse 34. Then Peter replied, I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. In every nation, he accepts those who fear him and do what is right. Verse 42, and he ordered us to preach everywhere and to testify that Jesus is the one appointed by God to be the judge of all, the living and the dead. Peter's heart had to grow to include everyone within the scope of God's heart. And that is everyone everywhere. So if we are going to do what Jesus wants done, we have to enlarge our heart. But on top of that, we're going to have to remember where our primary citizenship is. Where our primary citizenship is. Philippians 3.20 says, but our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, before any of you get your patriotic feathers ruffled, I'm proud to be an American, or at least I know I'm free. I, I, I got that. But being a citizen of heaven carries greater eternal weight and demands a greater allegiance than my earthly citizenship. I'm just, just being honest. We sometimes forget and we put 
our U.S. here and our heavenly citizenship here. And every time we do, we mess up what God wants. Every time. Every time. Now, mind you, I understand you may say, yeah, but you grew up somewhere else. And you're right. I grew up somewhere else. And I didn't get the whole, let's just say that the 4th of July was always second to the 28th of July in my book, because that was the Peruvian Independence Day. Okay, I, I, I got that. Uh, but one day at a history class at BCC, I finally figured out the history of this nation, and I said, that's why these Americans are the way they are. That's what I understood. And I'm happy and proud, and that's great. It's just not the main thing. When I was over in Spain one time, they, they asked me if I would come speak. They said, how do you pastor someone from 30 different nations? And I said, you give everybody a hard time equally. You just give everybody a hard time, even yourself. You just make fun of everybody equally. You put everybody on the same level, and then you make sure you put Jesus above it all. And that's what it has to be if we're going to reach this world. Our primary citizenship includes everyone who calls on the name of the Lord. Listen, Thanksgiving one year, this was about 12 years ago now, I was in Varanasi, India. Bad place to be on Thanksgiving. Your family's home. They're having a great time. It's, it's wonderful. At that point, I had a two-year-old grandson, the first one. I mean, it was a wonderful thing, and I wasn't there. And to make matters worse, I'm in the birthplace of Hinduism, Buddhism, and Jainism one of the most spiritually oppressing places on the face of the earth. I'm watching 200 bodies being cremated at the side of the Ganges and then throwing the ashes in the Ganges. And further down, block or two, all the people are bathing in this water and they're thanking the God of the Ganges and all of this stuff going on. And I see this little two-year-old with his eyes painted black all around because his parents had already given him over to the God. I remember seeing that kid and I remember thinking about Rylan, my two-year-old. I'm going, this is just not right. This is just not right. And the next day, after a 12-hour train ride, we're in Siliguri. And in Siliguri, we gathered with a group of about 140, 150 believers from all the denominations, all together for about a six-hour prayer meeting. And when I walked in there, I didn't understand a word that was coming out of their mouth. I didn't understand a lot of the things they were doing. I certainly could not sit on the floor with them for six hours. But you know what? I was home because I was with brothers and sisters in Christ. See, that number one citizenship trumps everything else. It is more important than anything you and I can do. Jesus made it very clear, render to Caesar that which is Caesar's, but render to God that which is God's. You and I can never forget that and still get the job done that he wants us to do. If we ever forget, if we try to make ourselves and our country something that God did not intend, then it will fail. Because he's going to get the job done. He just wants to do it with us. As someone put it, Jesus' last command should be our first priority. If we're going to do what Jesus wants, let me give you the third thing. We're going to have to think globally 
and act locally. Now, again, some of you are getting your things all ruffled. And I realize that this means, and this slogan has been used for many causes, from, from environmental issues to cancer treatments. They use this. But it also summarizes how we should think about the Great Commission. One of the amazing things about the century in which we live in is what people are calling worldwide migration. Let me give you some facts. 17% of the world's population is not in their country of origin. Most of the countries in the world list immigration or migration as a problem. Everywhere I go, literally every country I go to tells me this, we have an immigration problem. And I just laugh. I just laugh. I say, we all sound alike everywhere in the world. We all sound alike. Let me ask you a question. When the whole world is having the same problem, could it be that someone that's in control of the whole world might be doing something? Did you, did you think of that? See, because God is moving people around the world for his purposes. I don't, I don't know how many of you here have come from another country. But see, let's see if I describe. You got here and you immediately felt lonely. Something's missing. It's just not the same. Am I right? It's like, why do they do it that way? Now, some things you go, cool, this is great, but other things are like, do what? All the social things that you had around you that gave you stability, all of a sudden, you feel very unstable. Why? Because this culture is not your culture. These surroundings are not your surroundings. Every time I go to London to see the kids, the, you know the greatest thing I like about London? That when you go to a street, they've got it written down on the ground. Look the other way from what I, because normally I'd go, I'd look this way and I'd get hit by the car coming that way. <laughs> I'm glad they write that on there. But it's just, it's just not here. It's not bad. It's not better, it's not worse, it's just, it's just different. But people who move from another country get to this country and they are lost. And the same happens everywhere in the world. They get there and all of a sudden, all those social things that tied them, all those religious things, those things no longer seem as important. Can I ask a question? How many of you accepted the Lord when you moved somewhere else, whether it was a different state from where you grew up or from a different country. How many of you accepted the Lord after a move? Raise your hand. Why? Because all of a sudden, that hole in your heart that you always had, that you didn't really understand, that you filled up with other social stuff, you had family, you had friends, you had this, you had, you had all that stuff, all of a sudden that's removed and guess what? Oh my gosh, I feel a hole. And someone comes and says, hi, I'd like you to meet someone. It's Jesus. And all of a sudden your life changes. It, 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 it all changed after that. When people move, the gospel moves with them. I want you to pay attention to this video for just a second. What if we could go into all the world without ever leaving the U.S.? What if we saw people moving to our country as a missional opportunity? What if we reached the nations through our cities? What if God is sending millions of unreached peoples to North America for more than a better life? 
What if I didn't come to America for the American dream? What if I came as a part of the redemptive story? What if we responded to the fact that over half of the world's population now live in cities? What if I am more open to the gospel here than in my own country? What if the gates to unevangelized countries were open through American cities? What if the gospel spread through networks that already exist? Through business, through education, through migration. What if our cities became birthplaces for disciple-making movements around the world? What if I take my education and Jesus back with me to my country? What if the command to go met across town? What if American Christians were as good at missions in our homeland as we are overseas? What if the next challenge for missionary pioneers is not reaching remote villages, but reaching busy, hidden, influential people now residing in our cities? What if the strategic frontier of missions is closer to home than you think? What if the foreigner next door is one God wants to save? To reach thousands in Asia. And listen, in the Middle East. What if disciples were made through long distance phone calls? What if churches were started through Skype? What if churches not only adopted people groups overseas? What if we adopted the immigrant next door? What if immigrants reached immigrants? What if business people didn't just support missions? What if their business was used for mission? What if I used my home to welcome foreigners? What if I am the one God wants to use to reach the nation? What if I am the one? What if I am the one? What if you are the one? And what if a network existed to launch you into what God is doing among least reached peoples and cities? What if, what if? I don't think we know the answer to that. And that to me is one of the most exciting things about the 21st century and may I say living in South Florida as one of the hubs of the world. Here, here, here's some facts I want you to, to, to grasp. This was from Florida Trends Magazine just the other day. Each day in Florida, there are 1,632 people moving here from another state. 654 people move here from another country. And 613 babies are born every day. At the same time, every day, 1,148 people are moving away from Florida to a different state. 275 are moving to a different country. And 557 die. You add all that up. 919 people are added to Florida every single day. 335,435 every year. By 2020, which is just around the corner, we will have 21 million people living in Florida. And some of you are going, we're out of here. And may I say, good, because we need your house. <laughs> but if you're brave enough to say, wait a minute, you mean God's bringing all those people right here, next door? You've had a wonderful history of reaching around the world. And may I say this, you've done a better than most job in reaching the changing neighborhood that you're in. But there's still some empty seats. And there's still people coming. And let's be honest, we could actually move the chairs a little closer if we wanted to. And God keeps bringing people here. You know, those little stores that you see, remember down, let's see, State Road 7 down here, there was a little Asian store, remember? Whenever you wanted to buy an 
Asian pear you had to go there? Do you realize that every one of those stores has to represent a ton of people? They don't, they don't make that. They don't make a living on people that don't eat their food. So there must be a ton of people out there. I went Friday night, I went to the, to the stadium to watch Peru play Chile and soccer. I got there, and I'll be honest with you, I was blown away. I had just been transported back to Peru. There were 34,000 people, and I, I can assure you, 30,000 were Peruvian. I got out of the car and I smelled home. It was amazing. We got up, they sang the US national anthem and people stood up respectively whether they could say the words or not, but they went through the whole thing and then they sang the Chilean national anthem and everybody was semi-respectful while they were singing that. And then they sang the Peruvian anthem. And it's been a long time since I sang the Peruvian national anthem with 30,000 of my closest friends, I want you to know. And it was just like, whoa. Someone said, where'd all these Peruvians come from? I said, where there are 300 Peruvian restaurants just in Dade County, so somebody's here. Somebody. And may I say, South Florida's a better place because of it, but that's a different issue. <laughs> but it is amazing what God is doing. But before you think, well, but there's churches in Peru, there's churches that can reach them, everybody ought to reach their own. Let me tell you this. I just typed it in and Google said that in the Broward County Public Schools, there are 198 countries represented speaking 184 different languages. I'm not saying don't reach the world, I'm saying reach the world next door. At the same time that we're sending people around the world. You might be surprised by you being friendly to that ferner next to you. You may change the history of an entire family here and back wherever. And by the way, preparing a group of people that can go to places in this world that you and I can no longer go as missionaries. See, God is doing some amazing stuff in our world. He is just mixing it all up, and we all feel uncomfortable. I tell people all the time, if you're comfortable, something's wrong. Why? We should all feel the tension of what's going on. The world is, is crying out for things to be different, for things to be as God would have them to be. And may I say, the problems of our world will only be fixed when God is over all. We have a job to do. It's a global job, but it's, but it's, it's right there. We had someone come to our church a few years ago, and he said, how many of you know of a Muslim person in and around your circle, home, school, what, how many? Of, and 95 of our people raised their hand out of about 300, 95. And he said, how many of you just don't know how to reach them? And about 95 raised their hand. And he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you. You will never be more devoted to Jesus than they are to Allah. You will never be more religious than they are. But there's one thing you can do. You can love more than they can. That's not in their religious vocabulary. What do you do? 
You, you, you've got someone in front of you. They're dressed very different. You've heard a lot of things on the news. You've seen them use. You, you, you're, you're having 9-11 flashbacks just seeing the person. What do you do? Let me help you. You look at them and you say, hello. Can you do that with me? Come on. Hello. Evangelism 101. You go, Russell, you're making fun? No, because you know what we usually do? We look the other way. We walk away. We walk somewhere else. And there are some people that are in this country that have just gotten here, and they just want someone to acknowledge them with a smile. And if you'll do that, that smile, that hello. I don't know whether to shake hands or not. Don't worry about it. Say hello. If they stick their hand out, you put your hand out. If they're Latin and they happen to reach over to kiss, don't pull back and stick your hand out. Don't do that. <laughs> Just lean in. It, it won't hurt you. You might like it, but that's a whole different issue. <laughs> What am I saying? God's brought some wonderful things our way. How are we going to get this job done? Jesus said to his disciples in Samaria, lift up your eyes. Lift up your eyes. Get your eyes off yourself. Get your eyes off your situation. Get your eyes off of who you are. Lift your eyes. The fields are white for harvest. Love everyone everywhere. Serve everyone everywhere. Tell everyone everywhere. Go to everyone, everywhere. And together, you and I and God will get the job done. Let's pray. Lord, I come before you today. I'm so thankful that you stepped into the story of my family generations before I came on the scene. But Lord, even in my generations, just looking at my cousins and looking at other family members, Lord, I'm so happy for what you've done in us. Lord, as I look at people around the world, I see family trees completely changed, family histories completely moved because someone stepped into their life with the message of the gospel. Lord, where would we be without you? The same place so much of our world is and will stay until we go to everyone everywhere with the good news, the transforming power of the life of Jesus. Lord, I pray that you would use this church in a much greater way in the years to come than even what you've done in the past. May we all rejoice in heaven one day for what you've allowed us to be a part of. I ask it all in your precious name. Amen.